Central Department of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Fu Ling Zhang, Director of the Department of Social Development, National Development Council, NDC of Taiwan. Mr. Ken Wang, Deputy Director of the Department of Information Management, NDC. Mr. Frank Lee, Counselor of the Regulatory Reform Center, NDC. Ms. Jin Chen, Section Chief of the Regulatory Reform Center, NDC. Mr. David Chen, Designer of the Department of Information Management, NDC. Ms. Lulu Gen, Deputy Executive Chief Officer of the Open Culture Foundation. Mr. Chris Hong, Deputy Director General and Industry Consultant of the Institute for Information Industry. Ms. Isabel Ho, Co-Founder of the GOP Zero International Task Force. Distinguished viewers from Taiwan and the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Magandang umaga, sanyong lahat. Welcome to the virtual symposium featuring Taiwan Open Government Initiatives. I'm Michael Taeyong Xu, representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the Philippines. I'm very happy to be the moderator of this virtual conference. First of all, I want to thank both Honorable Minister Tang and Honorable Undersecretary Ablang for reaching out to our office to take initiative to hold this symposium. I also want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for supporting this project and coordinating with related government agencies and NGOs in Taiwan to make this workshop possible. Last but not least, I sincerely thank all the speakers who are so kind and generous to share their expertise in the aspect of the open government and the digital transformation with our friends in the Philippines. Finally, I welcome our Filipino friends, both from the public and from the private sectors, to participate in today's meeting. Three key principles of the open government are transparency, accountability, and participation. According to the Global Open Data Index, Taiwan ranked number one in 2016. Over the years, with the advancement of the cloud computing and the mobile services, as well as the collaboration between the public and the private sectors, Taiwan has continuously made progress in building a more open and accessible government that can restore citizens' trust and promote inclusive growth. Taiwan and the Philippines are good neighbors. My office serves, serves as a platform to advance the relations between our two countries. I believe that today's discussions will benefit both Taiwan and the Philippines. Finally, I wish today's symposium a great success and all distinguished speakers and the participants good health. Thank you. Maraming salamabo at mabuhay. Xie Now I would like to introduce the next speaker, Honorable Christian R. Ablan. Our next speaker for the opening remarks is Honorable Christian R. Ablan. Honorable Ablan serves as the Undersecretary for Administration, Finance, and the Freedom of Information of the Presidential Communications Operations Office, and uh, concurrently the Director of the Freedom of Information Project Management Office. Chris is a lawyer by profession. He holds a de degree in management from Ateneo de Manila University, a degree in law from the University of the Philippines, and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Auckland. Auckland is a beautiful city. I have been there several times. I'm very jealous of you, Chris. He is taking his second master in national security administration at the National Defense College of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's welcome Honorable Undersecretary Ablang to deliver his opening remarks. Uh, 
His Excellency Michael Pei Yung Shu, the Ambassador of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in the Philippines, the Honorable Audrey Tang, Digital Minister, Executive Yuan, our colleagues and partners from, and officials from various Taiwanese government agencies, as well as representatives from the different civil society organizations in Taiwan. Kanche Pai Mang, Su Chong Yi, Woman Kong Tu Chun Ru. Woman Siwang Suesi Tao Nin Te Chinyang. We also have our representatives from different national government agencies. We have representatives from the Department of Science and Technology, from Public Works and Highways, from Transportation, from Finance, from Social Welfare and Development, from Labor and Employment, and from our Privacy Commission. We also have our friends and partners from non-government and civil society organizations in the Philippines participating in today's symposium. We have our friends from Serolytics and WeSolve. These are data scientists. We have friends from the Makati Business Club and also Esquelabs. We have friends from Project Sparta of the, Depart of the Development Academy of the Philippines and from the La Salle Jesse Robredo Institute of Governance. We also have our friends from the Philippine Open Government Partnership based in the Department of Budget and Management and our friends from FOI Youth Initiative. And of course, my colleagues from the Freedom of Information Project Management Office. Shu Taren, Tui Putsi, Wata Chongwen Puhao. Wo Wang Le Tu Chai Kwang Si Se Xiao. In way wo tui wata chongko lao shi hen ke ai wo wo hui shi wo lao shi jin tian ni hen hao kan ni hen piao liang or lao shi ke yi zu ji ma wo ji shou jian or lao shi zheng bu gong bing wo bu shi zhong guo ren wo shi philippine ren suo yi wo bu neng shuo zhong wen Lao Shi, Tui Putsi, Wo Ting Putong, Wo Putur Tao. And Mr. Ambassador, if all fails, I would say Lao Shi, Wo Ai Ni. That's it. That's all the Chinese phrases I know that made me survive uh, elementary Chinese school here in the Philippines. Wo Shuo Le Wo Chi Tao Yi Jie. Kidding aside, it is my pleasure to welcome you all this morning to the FOI Virtual Symposium on the Taiwan Open Government Initiatives. The Freedom of Information Project Management Office is the lead agency tasked to operationalize and implement the Access to Information Program here. Since 2016, our office has continuously involved and engaged different implementers, stakeholders, and partners to achieve our main goal of providing Filipino citizens greater transparency and accountability in the public service by upholding the right to access information. Having an essential role in the Philippine government's call for transparency, accountability, and enhanced citizen participation, an effort which bears more relevance during this COVID pandemic, our office has planned to benchmark with our foreign counterparts to strengthen our networks and develop and enhance our capacities as transparency agencies. In lieu of the initially planned face-to-face -face technical visit to Taiwan, this virtual symposium shall enable our staff and other FOI practitioners to play their rightful role in the implementation of transparency and open government initiatives of the government. We at FOI Philippines truly recognize and look up to the achievements of Taiwan in various aspects of its digital transformation and open government agenda. And we want to learn more and benchmark with your practices through this virtual symposium. We acknowledge the importance of collaboration and knowledge sharing in promoting innovation in the FOI implementation and open government. I would like to acknowledge and thank our esteemed resource speakers from Taiwan, Digital Minister Audrey Tang of the Executive Yuan, Ms. Jean Chen of the Regulatory Reform Center National Development Council, Mr. David Cheng, the Designer, Department of Information of the National Development Council, Ms. Lulu Kang, the Deputy Executive Chief Officer, Open Culture Foundation, Ms. Isabel Ho, co-founder, Gov, Gov International Task Force, and Mr. Chris Hung, the Deputy Director General and Industry Consultant. 
Let me also thank our friends from the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office in the Philippines, led by Ambassador Xu, for helping us organize this virtual engagement. We hope that our learnings from the Taiwan experience will provide us insights that will be adapted and replicated to enhance our transparency initiatives and open government practices. So, to my colleagues, enjoy the sessions and gather all the knowledge you can get from this virtual symposium. Let's all have a productive morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Under Secretary Ablang. Your Chinese is amazing. Yeah. Your Chinese is very good. It's so amazing to hear, you know, after you know, uh, several years you know, of your graduation from school, to still remember uh, you know, what you learned uh, at school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the other interlocutor for session one, Honorable Audrey Tang, the Minister of Taiwan's, you know, I, I would like to say is digital uh, minister. And uh, Audrey, Honorable Audrey Tang is Taiwan's minister without portfolio. She is also known as our digital minister in charge of open government, social innovation, and the youth participation. Audrey is actively connecting the public and the private sectors to enhance the social innovation by using digital technology. Audrey plays an indispensable role in Taiwan's fight against COVID-19 pandemic. From the early on, from the early on mask distribution, contact tracing, SMS, and a QR code to, re to recent the vaccine reservation website. She provides timely and user-friendly platform for the general public. Today, we are very honored to have Audrey with us and share her views on Taiwan open government policy, as well as her experience to promote social innovation and the youth participation. Session one will be conducted via the dialogue between Undersecretary Ablang and uh, Minister Tang. Chris, Audrey, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, good morning, uh, Minister Tang. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, we look forward to our discussion, not only within the next 30 minutes, but later on during the open forum. Um, let me start, uh, Minister, uh, with my first question, since we have very limited time. Um, Minister Tang, tell us more about your organization, uh, the public digital innovation space, and what it primarily does, and how does the PDIS carry out its work alongside other ministries in Taiwan? Thank you for the uh, introduction and the excellent question. Is my sound uh, coming through okay for you? Yes. Yes, okay, very excellent. clear. So, um, in PIDIS, or Public Digital Innovation Space, it is a internal startup unit of sorts in the executive yuan. I'm a minister at large or with a portfolio, meaning that the office is comprised of people from all different ministries. We've had around 12 different ministries sending secondments to my office. Because each ministry or council only sent one secondment, there is no inferior or superior rank in my office. The National Communication Commission may send a very high level, like a section, um, sorry, a department head, but a, a foreign service may send a section chief. If they are in the same ministry, of course, there will be a superior inferior uh, relationship. But in our uh, office, they are all equals because they speak for the values of communication and foreign service, respectively. So by making sure that this horizontal composition is made, my role is simply to make sure that we can build common values out of different governmental positions. For each ministry has its own position, which is quite natural, but the way of digital is to connect those positions so everyone can save risk, to reduce the risk, and also to be more swift in rolling out the digital services. Moreover, my office also comprised of an additional, like 10 people, from the civil society. 
sometimes fellow occupiers from the sunflower movement in 2014. And they provide the expertise such as service design, interaction design, dynamic facilitation that currently we have no ministry for. So this is like a prototype of future ministries from the civil society experts into the executive UN. That's the composition of PIDIS. That is very fascinating, Minister, that uh, you take away the rank. Uh, here in the Philippines, we are very rank reliant. So whenever we have interagency meetings as an undersecretary, I have to expect that my counterpart from another ministry will also be an undersecretary. And to many, not me, but to many in, 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 in the bureaucracy, it's actually an insult if they send someone lower. Um, we are very fascinated about that because we understand the importance that the rank should be set aside when we're talking about uh, digital transformation. My next question, uh, Minister, is how does the PIDIS contribute to the Open Government National Plan of uh, Taiwan? Thank you. The National Action Plan is co-created by the social sector or civil society and the administration. Now, the composition is exactly, again, half and half. So the National Action Plan Task Force is half civil society people and half administration people. And I'm the chair uh, and I consider myself at kind of at a Lagrange point, like between Earth and Moon, there is some points with no gravity from both sides. So I can be uh, communicating across both working with the government and with the people, but not particularly for the government or for the people. Now, my role as a chair is simply to ensure that both sides have equal agenda setting power. So if the administration has some uh, roles in promoting, for example, inclusive participation for people under 18 years old. This is great because they don't have the right to vote, but they have a lot of ideas. <laughs> so our Minister of Education, as part of our open government plan, has a lot of uh, ideas. But who would represent those young people? Certainly not the uh, slightly older public servants <laughs> at the Ministry of Education. So on the civil society side, we have someone who's uh, not 20 years old, but um, 18 or 19, or uh, when she first joined uh, on open government work as a petitioner, she was just 17 years old, uh, Ms. Wang Xuanru. So on the civil society side, when we talk about youth participation, we actually have someone who's not even 20 years old serving as a full commissioner. And the way of PIDIS is to ensure that they can co-create without, again, suffering from, in addition to rank, age uh, discrimination. That, that, is, that is great. Uh, that is great to hear. Uh, also here in the Philippines, our uh, uh, open government partnership is also equal. We have equal representatives from government and equal representatives from civil society organizations. What, but we are limited by the qualifications. So we do not have a 17-year-old uh, representing the youth. But that should be something to be uh, thought about by our friends from open government Philippines. Uh, Minister, uh, PDIS and yourself as the, digit, as, a, as the digital minister is quite famous for social innovation. Can you share with us what social innovation is uh, to our colleagues who are hearing it for the first time? Certainly. <clears throat> social innovation means everyone's business with everyone's help. That is to say, <clears throat> everyone has the chance to co-create something that's beneficial to all. In industrial innovation <clears throat> or commercial innovation, what benefits are the shareholders and customers? If you do not buy the product or service, if you do not engage in the company, then of course you are not related and therefore have no voice. But <clears throat> on the other hand, social innovation means anyone can have a idea to improve the welfare of all. So for example, in Taiwan, we have a toll-free number 1922. So even people with no internet um, capability, they can just pick up a phone and call the toll-free number and suggest what they would like to see in the counter-pandemic effort. And that is one venue of social innovation. Uh, about that, my next question is related to that. I chanced upon join.gov.tw or the Public Policy Network Participation Platform. 
And I was very fascinated, Minister, how government can consider citizen proposals that garner 5,000 secondments or likes. Can you tell us uh, more about this uh, join.gov TW and how were you able to convince your colleagues from different ministries to seriously consider proposals coming from citizens? And are there any examples of such citizen proposals that were actually implemented by government? Certainly. The implementation rate is around half, meaning that uh, the proposals have roughly a half and half chance to get implemented in some way but maybe not in the original phrasing because while 5,000 people are very well suited to point out the problem, the actual solution need to be co-created by the administration. So we do have some proposals that are not ostensibly implemented. For example, there was a proposal that said we should change the time zone of Taiwan from <laughs> GMT plus eight to GMT plus nine, moving us into the future. <laughs> uh, but then another equal number of petitioners, again, thousands of people said Taiwan should remain in GMT plus eight. Now, obviously, we cannot satisfy both. But because of the participation officer network, we invited the chief petitioner of both sides, as well as anyone who supports them that has something to say, as well as all the administration uh, participation officers related to time zone logic to co-create. And once we start to meet, we find out the original petition is really not about time zone at all. It's mm -hmm. about making Taiwan's identity more uniquely seen in the world, as well as making a kind of some sort of world news <laughs> about our uniqueness. <laughs> but uh, we quickly agreed that this time zone change will only make 15 minutes of news and not very constructive ones at that. But we have to pay an ongoing recurrent cost. So we end up deciding and both sides agree we should make Taiwan more unique by taking the kind of budget uh, that will be required to implement the time zone change, but into developing national open government, national action plan, which will make Taiwan more uniquely seen in the world, as well as contributing to human rights, to welfare, to international humanitarian aid, uh, and so on. So in that sense, we didn't implement the idea, but we implemented the spirit. On the other hand, the uh, 16 to 17 years old, uh, Ms. Wang Xuanru, as I mentioned, proposed something that actually did get implemented. Mm. She proposed that we ban the plastic straws, among other single-use utensils, from the takeouts of, say, the bubble tea, which is very famous in Taiwan. Right. So the thing is that she wants to reduce the plastic waste in the sea for the marine uh, ecosystem because as you can see around that time uh, many photos like a sea turtle being choked by a plastic straw or something gets shared on the internet so in no time she got a lot of secondments the 5,000 people joining her and once we sit down and co-create with the people who actually manufacture those straws they said well 30 years ago, when we got into this business, we are also public health serving social entrepreneurs. We want to reduce hepatitis, among other diseases. But nowadays, we don't need uh, that anymore because it's cured, right? So they're also looking to go into a more circular economy based to manufacture such straws, like from literal biodegradable straw or from plastic or redesign the cup and so on. And so we co-created a timeline for phasing out those single-use plastic straws. And that was uh, really successful and accelerated uh, the acceptability of the new policy because even the businesses see that if they embrace the new model, the young people are willing to advocate for them. Thank you, Minister. That is truly uh, fascinating that the central or national government of Taiwan is open to proposals coming from regular citizens. In the Philippines, national policy is shaped only by our national legislators. So it's really fresh to know that our neighbor in Taiwan is actually listening to uh, young citizens as young as 17 uh, years old. Uh, I'd like to call out my friends from Philippine OGB to check on this. It's join.gov.tw. It's really fascinating and it's 
something that we look forward to coordinating with your office minister if we want to develop something. Now let's move on to uh, digital procurement, another kind of innovation that your government has implemented. Uh, minister Tang, can you um, share with us uh, how uh, you implement uh, digital procurement uh, in Taiwan and how do government agencies uh, utilize digital procurement? Certainly. In Taiwan, we put an emphasis on open API procurement, which is one of the ways to ensure large system integrators can work well with startups. Because while the bedrock infrastructure people, the large vendors are really good at providing the scale and reliability, the startups know how to reach new emergent needs of the people. So the glue that ties them together is the machine-to-machine -machine application programming interface or API. I will use some example. For example, uh, in the last year, we developed a mask rationing program where everyone can queue in line in pharmacies with their national health card to get the rationed masks. Now, the National Health Insurance Agency is very good in deploying this system to pharmacies. On the other hand, they are not that equipped to provide an interactive chatbot or real-time map or any of the other 100 or more ways to visualize the real-time stock of each pharmacy's mask so people do not have to queue in vain. So taking the best of both worlds, we procure the service of National Health Insurance Administration to update the real-time stock for each pharmacy every 30 seconds. It's like a distributed ledger. Now, this is really good because as a public servant, if I have to approve a number in freedom of information request before giving it out, and it turns out that this number is biased or is uh, one-sided, then I will take the blame. On the other hand, if it's, I'm just reading out or publishing the machine-generated real-time number, then even if the number is wrong, we get to correct it very quickly and people focus on the data quality not on the FOIA process. So updating every 30 seconds is superior from a risk uh, risk avoiding perspective than up updating every 30 days like the FOIA approach. So what we are doing is essentially opening up for the individuals to code up mask availability maps, chatbots, and whatever to visualize it in real time so the system integrators can focus on the site reliability and scalability. And we embrace it so much so that we change the contract for procuring information services so that um, for people with sight, if they deliver a website for people with sight and omit for people with blindness, with seeing difficulty, then this vendor could be disqualified for discriminating against people with blindness. And we add to that clause saying, if you provide only for human readable and writable service, but omit the machine to machine interface or open API when requested, then that vendor could also be disqualified for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's the effect. But that enabled the large vendor to work with startups very effectively. That is that is great. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues from the Philippines, uh, uh, Minister Tang, are all eager to ask you questions. So you can uh, hold on to that, guys. Uh, we have an open forum to be facilitated by Ambassador Shu uh, later on. It's uh, really all, all of the things that you are sharing right now really is very fascinating because I, I compare it to how we do it in the Philippines and we're very, very limited. And I hope my friends from the DBM would also open their eyes and allow open API. Uh, we conduct a lot of hackathons here, but the hackathons only remain to be ideas because after, the, after they win the hackathon, they cannot implement because we have to go through our procurement system. But uh, uh, let's go back to, to you, Minister Tang. Um, I'm not sure if this was already answered, but uh, we also heard about participation officers or POs and innovation officers. So I don't know if they refer to the same people who are sent from the different ministries. But how are they recruited or how are they chosen? Are they uh, newly appointed or did the, the government create a new office to be a participation officer or an innovation officer? Or were they, were they just designated on top of their current duties? Thank you. 
the PD's secondments are like a hub, and the POs, who are distinct group of people, are like a small PD's, but within each ministry. So each and every ministry, all 32 of them, have their own internal PDS-like structure, and that's the participation officer. Sometimes the PLs do rotate into PDS and then back, and on a rotating basis. But most of the PLs serve in their own ministry, because large ministries such as Ministry of Health and Welfare, each individual agency or administration below the ministry level is like a small ministry. They have their own uh, values. They have their own guidelines to operate. They have their own way of rule making. So on the ministry level, there needs to be a similar role as PDS on the administration level to hold those values together, to ensure reliable participation and transparency. Now, the POs are often appointed by their minister or deputy minister and report on open government matters directly to the minister or deputy minister. So it allows them to also work beyond their current rank. Some of them are just section chief rank. Some of them are in the very senior ranks. Uh, however, if they are POs, again, ranks do not matter. They report directly to the minister or deputy minister. Um, that is great considering you have PO scattered all uh, 32 ministries in Taiwan. How do you keep in touch with them? Um, here in the Philippines, we use uh, uh, platforms such as uh, Viber or uh, WhatsApp. Um, is there another platform, a uh, more sophisticated platform than, than, that, than a group chat that you, that you em employ in order to coordinate with your POs? Certainly. Uh, we use uh, call, something called Sandstorm. Uh, the website is called sandstorm.io. It's a very sophisticated uh, productivity uh, suite. So uh, just like Google Apps, but uh, it's free software and it's self-hosted. So it means that everyone can self-service and create new spreadsheets, new collaborative documents, new chat rooms and so on together without worrying about the approval process because this is not a procurement. This is literally free software <laughs> that we set up for the POs. We eventually add to that many uh, popular free software and open source choices such as Jitsi Meet for real-time video conferencing and among other things. But what I'm trying to say is that because this is not owned by any particular ministry or commission, this is what we call a digital public infrastructure that everyone can simply use. Recently, we've also completed the cybersecurity audit to add POLIS to polis.gov.tw. So each PO can set up their own visualized conversations where a machine learning algorithm help facilitate the different ideas into the coherent good enough consensus. We've used that very successfully in 2015 to moderate the UberX case. Uh, however, at that time it was still hosted on the cloud and in the overseas uh, company and so on. But nowadays, because this is free software, we've switched to house it locally and also make sure that the cybersecurity audit is complete. So the POs use the tools that may be developed around the world, but always hosted locally and with good privacy and cybersecurity premises. Thank you for sharing those platforms. I'm pretty sure my colleagues have no taken note of them. Uh, let's go back to the POs minister. Um, how does the PDIS uh, help? Uh, POs coming from agencies with different culture. Uh, I mean, you mentioned earlier that, you know, each ministry has a different kind of culture. You have a ministry that is very open to digital innovation, social innovation, and I'm pretty sure, very similar to the Philippines, you have had experience with ministries who are very old school and classical. So uh, what, what did you or PDIS do in order to convince them that this is the next generation of uh, government service? To be honest, uh, the people who are sent to my office as secondments all come from the very open cultural uh, ministries. So that means there remains to be seen whether another 10 ministries or so embrace the same culture. For example, the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone <laughs> to my office. <laughs> well, initially, the Foreign Service did not either. 
But then they discovered Twitter and public diplomacy and start sending people to my office because Twitter proved to be very important for public diplomacy, something people start to realize around 2017. So my point is that we will not force upon, say, the Minister of Defense uh, the spirit of open government. It is simply not feasible uh, to do it this way. However, the participation officer of the, say, Coastal Guard and so on, they're not idling because when we are holding co-creation meetings for, for example, uh, the tax filing experience redesign, we deliberately invite those uh, uh, facilitators in those uh, small groups we invite people, say the participation officer from the um, Coastal Guard or the, the participation officer from other unrelated ministries instead of the ministries of finance or the ministries of uh, like the uh, Fiscal Security Commission who are directly related to the fiscal uh, issues. And the reason is when people like ordinary people participate in such dynamic facilitated meetings, they see a public servant facilitating their uh, table of discussion. But uh, unexpectedly to them, this public servant take a very sympathetic stance toward the petitioner. Because if I'm a coastal guard participation officer, I'm talking about uh, the tax filing experience. Of course, I also file my own tax, so I will be very sympathetic. And uh, the coastal guard has no business to do with the system or the policy around taxing. So they will not feel compelled to defend the tax policy. Rather, they will be compelled to defend the petitioner's standpoint. So by on a rotating basis, making sure that the participation officers always get a chance to facilitate on the topics that they have no control over. We make sure that their public service expertise is used in a way that's sympathetic to the people and to the petitioners. And that's my answer. That is great. That is great. Uh, a, a great indirect way of convincing them to be part uh, of this uh, digital social uh, innovation. Um, Minister Tang, um, being open uh, is actually a double-edged sword. Um, and uh, in certain instances, you have hackers or uh, citizens who are not well-meaning and may use the, your platforms uh, to gather uh, data, maybe for commercial purposes, more maybe for uh, some sinister purpose. How does PDIS defend against these, uh, these things, uh, Minister? We work very closely with cybersecurity researchers or so-called white hat hackers. So they are our best friends. Before we deploy Sandstorm, we invited uh, DEFCOR, uh, a very famous team in the white hat community who won, I think, second place in global competitions, uh, such as DEFCON CTF, to do a penetration testing, meaning they attack our system uh, for, for a payment, of course, <laughs> and disclosed publicly the vulnerabilities, the weak points of our systems. And we do not open it to self-service generally without some sort of bug bounty or some sort of cybersecurity audit from those white hat hackers. And they have worked very closely to us so much so that uh, we made sure that they are treated like national heroes. In President Tsai Ing-wen's six core strategic industries, digital and IT is one, but cybersecurity is another. So cybersecurity is not just part of the digital or IT. It's now its own industry in the six core strategic industries uh, in President Tsai Ing-wen's second term plan. So that ensures they're treated uh, like national heroes, meet the minister or the president all the time, and also get paid very well. And all this so that they would not fall to the dark side, which has more cookies. All right, uh, Minister uh, Tang, my last question uh, would actually, <coughs> sorry. My last question would actually be um, how, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought, Minister. I think that would be my last question. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm pretty sure my colleagues would have uh, additional questions during the open forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Tang, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary Aplan. And uh, it it was a wonderful dialogue. I think all the participants learned a lot uh, from the discussions. And uh, now uh, I would like to move on to 
uh, the second session. Uh, the second session, we are going to uh, talk about uh, strengthen digital privacy and uh, personal data protection. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce our National Development Council, which is the open government policy implementing agency in Taiwan. And uh, the speakers of the second session uh, is from our National Development Council, and uh, our first presentation will focus on the topic strengthen digital privacy and the personal data protection. It will be presented by Ms. Jin Chen. Ms. Chen is the section chief of the Regulatory Reform Center of the National Development Council. Let's welcome Ms. Chen. Jin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Under Secretary Ablong and Minister Tom. Uh, job just gave us an inspiring conversation. Thank you for inviting me to join this meeting. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here to share our experience in open government national action plan in Taiwan. My name is Jin Chen. I'm from Regulatory Reform Center, National Development Council. I graduated from Suzhou University in Taiwan, and I got a bachelor and a master degree in law. I've been working in the Taipei city government for seven years. When I was there, I managed the meetings with citizens and the mayor. Citizens addressed their suggestions directly to the mayor and the department of Taipei city government will study those suggestions carefully and reply to the citizens. That is my first image and experience of public participation. About 13 years ago, I transferred to current department, National Development Council. I dealt with the regulations of the digital economy for several years. At that time, I realized that global trends of the digital economy are closely connected with data. Maybe we could say, who owns data, who owns the future? But when the use of digital technology conflicts with personal data, how should we do? When we try to address our open government action plan, we collect the opinions from the public. Many people care about this issue. After discussion with OGP partnerships from the private sector and experts, we address this commitment. Today, I will talk about this issue, strengthen digital privacy and personal data protection. This is today's agenda. My slides will have six topics. Firstly, is the introduction. Secondly, I will talk about the commitment issues, which are strengthening personal data protections and data protect impact assessment. Thirdly, is the progress of the commitment issues. And the fourth, I will talk about the connection between commitments and open government. Then I will show you the timeline of commitments. And finally, is the conclusion. As we all know, data has become the new energy in the digital economy and ICT era. When we develop artificial intelligence, big data analytics, and smart government-related technologies, they all need to use tons of data. When those data connected personal information, that would become a big issue, which need to be reviewed carefully. How to balance both personal data protection and the reasonable data use 
has become an important topic faced by governments in the whole world. It's also the international personal data protection chains. On May 24, 2018, the executive yuan gave the NDC the task of establishing the Personal Data Protection Office. The aim was to respond to digital economy and technology development, align with international data protection chains, such as uh, the EU has implemented the GDPR, which is to be said a rigorous personal data protection framework. And we also noticed the neighboring Asian countries such as Japan, South Korea, and Singapore have amended and adjusted their personal data protection laws in recent years. And the most important mission is to enhance people's digital privacy and protection of personal data. The Personal Data Protection Office was established on July 4, 2018. On July 10, the same year, the National Development Council replaced the Ministry of Justice to become the governing authority of the Personal Data Protection Act. The office has two main tasks. The first is coordinating all matters relating to the GDPR and to initiate adequacy talks with the EU to secure an adequacy decision regarding the GDPR requirements. And the second is ensuring the compliance and enforcement of the PDPA by all ministries and to strengthen the data protection environment and mechanism in Taiwan by coordinating and working with different ministries. One of the NDC's tasks is to research and propose the direction of our policy on the amendment of Personal Data Protection Act. In order to effectively achieve the tasks, we are keeping collecting opinions from the public and the private sector, and also from the academia. Those important issues of personal data protection including cross-border transmission, industry use of personal data, rights of data subjects, and the independent data protection agency, and so on. We not only collect the opinions, but also research and solve the regulatory systems of developed countries. When the Open Government National Action Plan was approved by the Executive Yuan in February 2021, NDC promised to include strengthening personal data protections and data protection impact assessments in Personal Data Protection Act amendment discussions. In this slide, I will show you the timeline and what we did and how we accomplished the commitment list. In October 2020, the Executive Yuan Open Government National Action Plan Task Force first meeting decided to include strengthen digital privacy and personal data protection suggested by civil society as a government commitment. In December of the same year, the NDC held the Strengthen Digital Privacy and Personal Data Protection Working Group meeting. The commitment list was filled in by using the public-private partnership method. Also in December, 
the NTC reported the commitment list of strengthened digital privacy and personal data protection in the Executive Yuan Open Government National Action Plan Task Force Second Meeting. And in February 2021, the Executive Yuan promulgated the Taiwan Open Government National Action Plan and requested each responsible agency to handle the plan according to the schedule. Strengthen digital privacy and personal data protection officially become one of the commitment issue of Taiwan Open Government National Action Plan. In this slide, I will show you the five major categories and 19 commitments in Taiwan Open Government National Action Plan. The first category is promote open data and the freedom of information. It included five commitments, which are completing government open data and data sharing mechanism, establishing an open data set platform for value added use, strengthen digital privacy and personal data protection, which is today's topic, and enhancing information access in the freedom of government information law, and information disclosure relating to the environment. And the second category is is banned the public participation mechanism. It included five commitments, which are national referendum electronic joint signatures, youth policy participation, establish a regional revitalization interactive platform, facilitate the formation of labor unions, include the concept of open government into the civic curriculum and teaching and empower teachers. And the third category is increased gender and the ethnic groups inclusive dialogue. It included four commitments, which are promote gender inclusive dialogue and participation promote new immigrant public participation and development, increase indigenous people's cross-domain participation and international linkage, and promote public participation on Hakka issues. And the first category is enhanced integrity policies. It included three commitments which are enhance political donation transparency, establish and improve the government procurement in integrity platform, and legislation of the Whistleblower Protection Act. And the last one is anti-money laundry. It included two commitments, which are beneficial ownership transparency and policies on financial transparency of a religious groups to close AML loopholes. And what's the commitment of a strengthened digital privacy and personal data protection? During the public consultation, People proposed to amend the Personal Data Protection Act regarding the obligation to inform, consent, right to object, right to make an inquiry of, and to review his or her own personal data, notification of a personal data breach, and the data protection impact assessment to ensure the legality of the data collection, processing, and use in the future. 
The issues discussed in the undertaking can be divided into the following two major categories. The first is strengthening personal data protections. And the second is data protection impact assessment. In the following slide, I will talk about five issues of strengthening personal data protection. And when we dealt with those issues, we keep to follow the core values of the Open Government Partnership, which are transparency, participation, and accountability. The first issue is right to object. The Personal Data Protection Act provides data subject the right to ob object to marketing. Apart from the aforementioned situation, whether the data subject can object the collecting agency to the use of his or her own personal data, even though the data is legally collected. Discussion will be carried out of whether in practice there is the need to add regulations on course and the related restrictions for the data subject when they exercise the right of objection. And if we should add new regulations, what kind of contents and procedures should be included? And the second issue is right to make an inquiry of and to review his or her own personal data. Although the Personal Data Protection Act provides the data subject inquiry and viewing request rights, it is worth discussing whether the scope of the inquiry or viewing request covers the records generated by all their online activities. It will be discussed whether the Personal Data Protection Act should explicitly provide the right to make an inquiry of and to review the personal data includes records generated from the data subjects online activities or whether the current interpretation of the act can already include such records, but must be made clear through guidelines or letters. And the third issue is the obligation to inform. The Personal Data Protection Act has regulations relating to the obligation to inform the data subject when directly or indirectly collecting his or her personal data. However, such obligation to inform is not stipulated for the use for another purpose or use of open data to make a decision through automatic processing. And this is worth discussing. We will discuss whether the obligation to inform and the methods of informing regarding the use for another purpose and use of open data to make a decision through automatic processing need to be stipulated in the Personal Data Protection Act. The first issue is consent. Although the Personal Data Protection Act stipulates that the consent of the data subject is one of the elements for legally use his or her own personal data, the current methods of consent are too general and have become a mere formality with disputes often occurring. We will consider whether the requirements of the data subject's consent 
need to be strengthened in terms of autonomy, specifically knowledge and certainty. And whether there is a need to add a provision that the data subjects may withdraw their consent or whether the interpretation of the Personal Data Protection Act can already include it. But it must be made clear through guidelines or letters. And the fifth issue is notification of personal data breach. The Personal Data Protection Act stipulates that when personal data infringement occurs, after relevant facts have been clarified, the data subject shall be notified via appropriate method. Are the methods and items when notifying the data subject clear enough? Some competent authority requires that when personal data breach occurs in the non-government agencies, they must report to the competent authority. But there is no administrative penalty for value to do so. In this issue, we will discuss the possibility to specify the notification methods and items through guidelines when it comes to a personal data breach and whether we should edit a new provision in Personal Data Protection Act to stipulate that when the personal data leak, the competent authority should be informed. If so, what's the information should be given to the authority? In this slide, I will talk about another topic of this commitment, which is data protection impact assessment. Although the enforcement rules of the Personal Data Protection Act st stipulate that a mechanism of risk assessment and management of personal data must be adopted, it is not clear as to which operations need to be assessed or how to assess. In this issue, we will discuss whether it is necessary to introduce a new provision on data protection impact assessment in the Personal Data Protection Act. And if it's necessary to do so, What's the applicable circumstances, scope, and elements of assessment and the supporting measures? In this slide, I will talk about the progress of the commitment issues. On May 6, 2021, the NDC held a meeting on the four issues of strengthened digital privacy and personal data protection, namely the right to object, right to make an inquiry of and to review his or her personal data, obligation to inform and consent. In a meeting, EU GDPR, US, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore's Personal Data Protection Acts were put forward in the opinions of civic society members, scholars, and experts, and association representatives was solicited. This meeting seeks input from the following directions. The first is, do these issues require amendment of the Personal Data Protection Act, or can be dealt with by issuing guidelines or letters? And the second is, if amendment is suggested, what will be the possible impact on society and industry? In July 2021, the NDC will continue to solicit 
and discuss issues such as notification of personal data breach and data protection impact assessments that have not yet been discussed in the strengthened digital privacy and personal data protection. In a meeting in May, we only invited the civic society member who is interested in this topic. In order to increase interaction between government and civic society, this meeting in July will invite all civic society members to put the spirit of public-private partnership into practice. Someone were wondering what's the connection between commitments and open government and what's the problems that the commitment seeks to solve. I think there are three main points. First of all, in response to the development of digital technology, the sharing and use of personal data has become a trend. In order to prevent personal data from being arbitrarily collected, processed, or used by others in the absence of the data subject's self-awareness, the rights of the relevant subject should be strengthened. Secondly, enhancing the digital privacy and personal data autonomous control of the data subject will help he or she to understand the use of his or her personal data by a collecting agency and exercise their rights on time. Finally, the personal data protection impact assessment will help the collecting agency assess the risk and the necessity of personal data use to facilitate management and response and to enhance the protection of the privacy and personal data of the data subject. And when we back to the core value of open government, we know the transparency is allowing people to know what is happening. And the participation is to that citizens express their opinions and discuss the policy in the policy making process. And the accountability is when citizens have doubts of the policy, they know who should be reviewed. When it comes to the transparency, we think the commitment will increase the transparency of personal data processing. Through discussion of issues for the rights of sub data subject, such as objection, right to inquiry or request of viewing, obligation to inform, notification of per personal data breach and consent, and other issues, that strengthen the protection of data subjects. Appropriate control measures are established to enable the data subjects to know and understand how their personal data is collected, processed, or used to ensure fair and transparent use of personal data. When it comes to the participation, we think the commitment will increase the participation of the data subject. As people's awareness of digital privacy and personal data protection is gradually increasing, the clarification of the requirements for consent to the collection processing or use of personal data will help the data subject 
knows what is happening and fully express their consent or disapproval during the process, allowing the data subject to decide for themselves whether to participate in the personal data use process. When it comes to the accountability, we think the commitment will ask the, the accountable collecting agency carries out a personal data protection impact assessment. The personal data impact assessment allows the collection agencies to assess the risks that may arise in the process of personal data use and to formulate appropriate control measures based on the results of the risk analysis in order to fulfill the legal compliance obligations imposed on the collection agencies by the Personal Data Protection Act. And the public also could review. In this slide, I will talk about the timeline of commitments. By the end of this year, we plan to do some research in various issues relating to commitments, including collection and research of developed countries legislation and the opinions of experts, academics, and the industries in compiling consultation opinions. In 2022, we will focus on the direction of the draft amendment to the Personal Data Protection Act with reference to the consultation opinions and to issue relevant guidelines on important issues related to the protection of the rights and interests of the data subject, which now need to revise the Personal Data Protection Act. And finally, complete Personal Data Protection Act draft amendment and submit to the Executive Yuan in May 2024. To sum up, in the digital era, information sharing and public-private partnership are important parts of open government. Based on the spirit of the commitment and the core value of transparency, participation, and accountability, the NDC will continue to promote strengthen digital privacy and personal data protection, this commitment. Through discussion and exchanges of opinions, with civic society members, experts, and scholars, and representatives of public associations. We will continue to promote the revision of the Personal Data Protection Act or the publication of relevant guidelines with reference to international legislation and collected opinions on the premise of balancing both personal data protection and reasonable use of data. Here are my presentations today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. You know, it's a very uh, detailed and wonderful presentation. And uh, I learned a lot from your presentation. And it seems to me that uh, to maintain a balance uh, among personal data protection and uh, data uh, accountability and uh, transparency is very delicate. Okay, this session uh, will last until 10.25. Now is the QA period. Uh, since I uh, haven't seen any uh, question in the Slido, and I would like to use my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question. 
Jean, I would like to know, uh, is there ever a time when you have to restrict the public access to data? Uh, generally, the government information is available to the public according to the freedom of government information law and the law is governed by Ministry of Justice, uh, not NDC. <laughs> According to the Freedom of Government Information Law, in some circumstances, such as the information is classified by law as national secrets or making available to the public, we are abstract the investigation, prosecution, or law enforcement of a crime may restrict public access to data. But if the question is about the uh, open data, uh, I'm not in charge of this issue, but my colleagues in the next section are from the department that responsible for the policy of open data. May I let my colleagues get back to you in the next session? Okay, Jean, no problem. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, uh, Chris, do you have any question you would like to raise or? Yes, Mr. Ambassador, I have a question yes. for Jean. Jean, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I don't know if you listened to my interview with uh, Minister Tang earlier about the public policy network participation platform. That's uh, join.gov.tw. And I was wondering uh, how um, inf personal information is handled by this uh, website. Uh, if it allows anonymous proposals, <coughs> excuse me, or are proposals required to... I or are citizens required to identify themselves? Um, I'm interested from uh, your point of view on uh, protect, protection of privacy. In terms of using this platform, join.gov.tw, yeah? Uh, excuse me, your, is your question, question is about the uh, uh, data.gov.tw. Uh, excuse me. It is from the uh, Department of Information Management. Actually, the joint platform is built by our department, so maybe I can answer these questions. Uh, as you mentioned, that if there are any personal data in the joint platform, actually, we didn't, uh, we don't keep any personal data in there, but we will ask the the proposal to leave their uh, uh, email account or the the phone number, then we can we can contact him to uh, have some detailed information when this proposal have get a five thousand support from online. So that's that's our our case, but we don't uh, keep the personal data. So is that your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. That uh, that addresses my concerns. So uh, a question, uh, a proposal can be anonymous, and the minimum requirement is to give an email or a contact detail. I only I only ask is because sometimes citizens may be hesitant, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for uh, submitting a proposal because out of fear of being ridiculed uh, if the proposal is not that uh, you know uh, intelligently articulated. So thank you for the answer. No problem. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, NDC. And now I I see on Slido there are three questions, but the two are for uh, Minister Tang, and we'll uh, convey the two questions to uh, Minister Tang's office. Uh, there is one question uh, I would like to ask Jing. Is uh, in your view, what is viable way to populate government with data experts? Most experts are either in private sector or abroad. Training versus hiring. Jin, do you get this question? Uh, 
So Jin, would you like to answer or your team? Oh. Okay. I think it's a good question. However, I don't have any further information right now. Okay, no problem. Mr. Ambassador, maybe yes. we can convert the question instead of data experts, privacy experts. Uh, we also have a similar problem here in the Philippines where most privacy experts are actually only in the private sector. Uh, and in government, we have to actually uh, train. So we were wondering how, how it went in uh, Taiwan. The privacy experts in government, were they trained from within? or did, were they recruited from the private sector? I guess that was the question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jing, do you want to address this question? Oh, okay, and may I also uh, substitute to answer this question as possible? Uh, actually, the scientists uh, of data um, expert uh, Mostly, we we train our uh, government uh, officers to to familiar with this area, but also we cooperate with the civil society because when sometimes uh, civil society they they are like an uh, interface of government and uh, the the citizens, so they know better about how to use the data to to make a good application for our general public. So that's not the um, mostly there's not a, a issue of technology. There's the issue of idea and uh, innovation. So we like to cooperate with the social society and also to to um, ex experts from the uh, uh, national wide uh, the the people. So does that answer your questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it does. I think uh, you. You guys in uh, Taiwan are uh, really just uh, open to uh, help each other. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ken. Uh, there's another question uh, on the Slido. Uh, how do you recognize a certain civil society to be eligible to participate in the National Action Plan as well as part of the PDIAs? Jing? Do you get it? Jing, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, is, may I answer this question? This question is about. Open data. Uh, excuse me. I, I think the the director general of our uh, social development. Uh, department will answer this question. Is that possible for him to answer it? No problem. Yes. Go yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, in a certain civil society, to be able to uh, participate in this uh, national action plan, uh, I I think uh, in our process to uh, develop this uh, NAP, uh, we uh, primarily invite some civil society representative representative uh, people who come from the different uh, uh, civil society to, and to join the meeting, especially in the multi-stakeholder forums and to, to, to find, uh, to invite them to uh, join this forum and uh, to discuss in the different uh, topic. And uh, after that, uh, we get some uh, conclusion to, uh, to uh, classify the, um, different uh, topic uh, about the commitment uh, for the NAP. So uh, the process, uh, we just uh, invite them. The, it's active uh, by the government department, uh, but the different way to, uh, the civil uh, society, they can um, just uh, propose some person to, who can represent them to, to join this. So uh, the, this is our pro progress uh, to do that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Fuling. 
Uh, yeah. Now I think we have a uh, uh, time only for one more question. Uh, I don't know if there is. I I, I now I don't see uh, additional question on Slido, and uh, I would like to ask the question. Okay, time is up for this uh, <laughs> session. Now we have to move on to the the next session. Uh, the next session, session three, uh, is open government data status. Uh, our next uh, presentation is the open government data status in Taiwan. And Mr. David Chen will share with you how the government agency in Taiwan share their data with the public and give you examples on the data application. Uh, Mr. Chen serves as the designer in the Department of Information Management of the National Development Council. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Can uh, can hear this my song? Yes, no problem. Yes, go okay. ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is David from NDC. Next, I, we would like to share the current status of open data, including the flat portal in Taiwan. Taiwan is transferring from e-government to smart government. In smart government, the data is the core to construct a public-private collaboration. Next, I will elaborate on the government open, open data portal and the application cases of open data in our country. Here, I will talk about open data definition and scope. Regarding the open data, open data is data that can be identified and there are two kinds of it. First one is purely open data, that freely open to anyone. It's open format, free of charge, irrevocable, and can be sublicensed to reuse, such as weather, air quality, etc. Sorry. Uh, okay. The other one is conditional open data that provided by application. It also in op open format, but may chargeable, revocable, and sublicensed by permission, such as high resolution GIS data. This is our one stop open data portal. This is the data.gov.tw website, as you can see in the picture. Our government established a single portal to display the metadata and the links to the open data content. People can click a link to get the data directly without feeling that the data is stored in respective agencies. In addition to open datasets, People can also find the open data applications built by public and private, and the open data related regulations on this portal. Here is the example of metadata for open data sets. Uh, Within the metadata, we can figure out the information uh, like data sets, name, data fields file formats, agencies as providers, contact person, update frequency, authorization method, and update time. The number of purely open data sets has been increasing. So far, it's about 49,000, and the most popular data are those related to transportation, real estate, trading price, air quality, and weather. The growing of the dataset number is important, but it is not the goal we are pursuing. Now we are more focused on the reuse of open data by general public. We have three main me mechanisms to encourage the use of open data. 
The first, we can see the top figure is to improve the open data quality. The second, we can see the right figure is to comply with CC by 4.0 and grant users the right to sublicense their product to others. The third one, we can see the last figure is to cooperate with private sectors and communities to promote innovative applications. As you can see in this open data metadata, this is the page in here telling about the data detail. It displays data quality. The, uh, the first is data quality here. And the second is the license it comply. And the third is data applications using, we can see the using data sets, which application using this data set. In this way, users can understand more about quality, the way to and the way to sublicense and other people application of the data set. This page shows the way how we strengthen data quality and attraction. To encourage agencies to provide data with high quality and high applied value, as well as urge them to use data more practically, three awards have been especially set up since Open Data Rewards program was held in 2018. The following is some simple explanation. First one, we can see the yellow part. Uh, we set Golden Quality Award to encourage agencies to provide high quality data, which can, can be directly assessed, structured, and uh, integrated correctly. The second one, we can see the red part. We set up popularity award to encourage agencies to provide data that people need. The third, we can see the green part. We set up, we set up application award to encourage agencies to conceive the data application. This page, I will talk about how we establish a reliable open environment. To ensure that Taiwan's license, licensing terms from, for open government data are simple, clear, easy to apply, and in line with international practice, acting upon an initiative from the private sector, the terms of an open government data license have already been set through a collaborative planning process involving the private sector, central government agencies, and local governments. These terms will be continuously revised in line with trends of development in open data, so as to meet the needs of all sections of society. Finally, Taiwan's open government data license was produced together by the government and public and become the first open license term, which reviewed by open definition in Asia. With those promotion, civilians have created a very variety of services. I would like to show you some examples. First one is, we can see the picture. First one is the email to assist the purchase of masks. In response to COVID-19, government implemented a medical mask rationing mechanism. It also opened and updated the data on the location of pharmacies and their mask inventory every three minutes. The communities created more than 100 different map apps to real time indicate where you can still buy the masks. The second case is sales forecast. The company, the Dakapa, used to have raw materials expired and scrapped frequently due to an inaccurate sales forecast. Now they use the stored data, such as POS data, and the open data 
with AI analytics to make better predictions. By doing so, they reduced monthly raw material costs by 13% and increased sales by 18%. In our government open data portal, people can find out many interesting and valuable applications. For example, uh, we can see the first one uh, that's, uh, that's up using weather forecast and air quality data. This weather forecast data app can help users prepare for the need in advance before they go out. The second one, we can see the right up. The app for friendly parenting environment. This app is to integrate and related government information about parenting. For example, location breathe feeding rooms, nearby hospitals, and the calendar for pregnancy checkup, so that parents can quickly consult. The third one is food safety tips. This app can provide technical chemistry terms about the processed food ingredients so that people can clearly know the additive toxicity. The fourth is garbage truck tracking. Chinese take out garbage whenever we hear a specific sound played by garbage truck. This is a distinctive feature in our garbage collection system. This app can help people save time if the truck drivers are stuck in a traffic jam. This page I will introduce for presidential hackathon. Presidential Hackathon is an initiative designed for Chinese government to demonstrate its emphasis on open source data, data utilization, and practice innovation to address the needs of the country in social innovations. Our president has also encouraged open data innovation by holding presidential hackathons for four consecutive years to facilitate exchange among data owners, data scientists, and domain experts to gather the wisdom of courts across governments, industry, and private and public sectors. This is one of the excellent presidential hackathon teams. What to save using big data and, and machine learning to detect water leakage. Obtaining real-time data of water supply from supervisory control and data acquisition system and automatic meter reading system. He also integrates government open data to build a water leakage detection and auxiliary system. The team the team was invited by the New Zealand government to co-create solutions to address water leakage. Presidential Hackathon this year is held jointly by our National Development Council and the Ministry of Economic Affairs. We also welcome experts for all walks of life can propose to participate together. Thanks. Thanks for your listening. Okay, David, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, very good uh, presentation. And uh, now uh, is uh, our QA time. You know, uh, now it's 10.39 and uh, David, uh, you know, uh, was very efficient, you know. Uh, so now we have more time for QA. This session will last until 11.10. So, uh, since I haven't seen any uh, question on Slido, I would like to ask a question uh, now. So, yes. uh, Ambassador, may I make some uh, addition, additional um, explain, explanation? Go ahead, please. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, I want to add something. In the slides, uh, we talk about the open data portal. And this portal not correct the open data of AV agencies. Actually, we only correct metadata, metadata of the open data, and those metadata including some link. And, and the, the user can link, can click the link and uh, redirect back to the uh, responsible agencies to get the real data. And also, if this uh, agency provide the API application interface, then the user can use their program to make a machine to machine reading, read the API, and they can make a, a real time applications for them. So that's, that's uh, I want to add this. Um, our portal didn't uh, keep the, any real data. Yet. We only keep the, the metadata. And the second one is that we have three mechanisms to improve or to uh, promote our uh, open data. Those three, three mechanisms, uh, all the purpose is to um, to uh, uh, ask our people to reuse the data. So the purpose is to make the reuse the thing of reuse to be easier for everyone. So you can see the uh, data quality and uh, the sub-license mechanism. And also we have some promotion or some example for the general public to let them know how to use the data, how to make a profit of the data. So they can uh, um, easier to uh, use those data and they can easier to see how other people can use the data and they can copy the, the mechanism and copy the, 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 the usage way. And then we, we do these things to make the uh, usage pie bigger for the general public. And that's why I want to uh, make uh, some explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much for your additional uh, comments. And uh, OK, and since now it's a QA uh, period, uh, I would like to uh, Ask the, the first question, uh, David. Is your open data portal different uh, compared to data, GOV, TW? Are these two information portals distinct? <laughs> okay, allow, allow me to to answer it because I am the sphere of this uh, department. Uh, actually, the data. Open data portal is the same as the data .gov .tw, so that's the same same thing. And uh, on this portal, as I mentioned, that they only keep the metadata, and the user can click a link to the the real data stored from the other agencies. So that's the same thing. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay, I have a, another question. Um, how does the private sector make use of open data? What types of information are typically sought or requested? Uh, okay, there are three ways for the people to use the open data. First, they can click the link on the open data platform, the data data.tw. But since the data is real stored in the every agency, so the user also can click the the uh, data of this agency's portal or the the website. And the third way is the API that people can make the application to read the to uh, assess the API. So then they don't need to click a link to get the data back and uh, fit in the application. They can just use the machine-to-machine -machine mechanism to read the API to get the data. So these three kinds of the mechanism to use the data. And for the uh, popular data, mostly they are um, the most popular data are all related to to the daily life like the real-time transportation, financial trade, weather forecast, uh, air quality, electricity generation, earthquake response, and so on. So that's mostly because those data are uh, close to the daily life of the people. So people like to read the data. And also the app creator, 
they like to use those data and uh, generate uh, uh, um, integrate become a, a app for the people. For example, they can make the transportation data and the weather data and other um, uh, resort data to become a travel app for the people. They can know when they have a time, they, they can go, go to somewhere they, they want to visit. It's easier for them. So those kind of apps are very popular uh, for the general public. So the user have all, all the uh, program creator, they have the incentive to make those kind of data to make the application for the general public. So that's why those kind of data are very popular for the, the user or for the uh, program makers. That's my answer. Thank you, Ken. Uh, now I see several questions uh, on Slido. And uh, OK, uh, there is one question uh, I would like to raise the first. In the Taiwan experience, how important is a successful open data program to enabling tech zones? Do you get it? Uh, excuse me. OK, in the Taiwan experience, how important is a successful open data program to enabling hack zones? You got it? Yeah, yes, I got it. Uh, actually, the presidential hack zone is the key to, 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 um, to make the example for people to use the data and to stimulate the innovative thinking of the people to use the data not the the uh, uh, data application to stimulate uh, the uh, presidential hexon constraints is presidential hexon to improve the thing or improve or to uh, stimulate the the uses of the data to demonstrate that our president are very emphasized on this open data reuse so this kind of presidential hex songs is a very important key to uh, let our people know that the open data is very important. And also that our uh, government agencies to know that our very high level, they are very emphasized on the open data. So these agencies have to very um, open mind to open as, as, as possible their data to the general public and let the people to reuse those data. So that, that's, that's, that's my uh, explanation. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, now we have a question from Under Secretary Ablong. Did the Open Data Awards provide a cash price? Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> we don't have a cash price for the for the uh, our government uh, uh, employer or for the general public, but for the government employer, we have some price that they can use those price if they want to uh, apply for some um, uh, promotion. They can use those price as the credit of their of their uh, 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 buyers. So that's our mechanism, and also. Actually, the sometimes the rewards are not only a reward because every uh, mystery they are, they will compete to each other, and they will think the reward as a comment, and they will think if they uh, didn't get the reward or didn't uh, cross to the 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 threshold of the reward, then they will feel that they are not very um. Uh, good at this open data field. So the ministers, every every ministry, ministers always uh, think the reward is very important and they want their uh, employer to to um, to do their best to get the reward. So let's, let's not only reward, let's become a competition factors for the, the ministries. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I think the re reward is very important. I, if I may suggest, I hope to see in the future we have the cash price. <laughs> cash price that people could feel it, 
you know <laughs> immediately. And then there's a question, uh, especially for Davy. So Davy, prepare yourself. To what extent are these presidential hexagon outputs being implemented in your government? Davy, did you get it? Okay, I'll repeat it, Davy. To what extent are these presidential hexagon outputs being implemented in your government? So, David? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, because it's secretary for four years, and there are three past years, and each year have five uh, excellent team. But uh, here's one. Uh, let me check the data. So, Evie, no more. What, 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 what? <laughs> I, Sorry, I, I think this uh, question may be uh, maybe a little bit wider for for us because presidential, as, as you can see, that presidential hexagon is uh, in charge by the president office, and also we we just. Uh, uh, how to say to to uh, make it possible and to do some logistics things, and for the output, I think uh, uh, actually uh, we want uh, the output become the outcome of this uh, presidential hexons, and also we want uh, every government, not only government, the civil society, the data experts and scientists, or even the the uh, the other countries can join in this uh, presidential hexons and then to make it become a very very useful experience or useful uh, example for our for our uh, citizens or even for the other countries can can get uh, some uh, some knowledge from them for example we have we have a uh, one case that let's say to to detect the pipeline uh, leaking uh, uh, in, 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 in that hexagon uh, teams. And after they have some, um, some, some uh, output of that, the, the other countries, I, I, I believe that's uh, New Zealand, they invite this team to their country to teach them how to use those open data, how to use the data and some AI uh, mechanism to detect the pipeline link. So I think this is uh, also a very good uh, example to make uh, some um, connection with the other uh, countries. I, I don't know if that uh, answered the questions. Yes, you did. You did answer. You know, because they would like to know is the output of the X hexon. You know, uh, the one you just mentioned. You know, uh, to detect the leakage from the water pipe. I think is one of the, you know, outputs uh, which are actually uh, even in, it's not implemented in our government, but the New Zealand government invited the team to New Zealand to help help them to use the, the open data. You know. So uh, I think you already uh, at least uh, you know partially answered this question. Now we have more questions. I would like to ask the next one is: Do you have any advice on how we can strategically upskill information officers in different government agencies, considering that not everyone is tech savvy? It means you know not everyone knows you know the, the new technology so well, and uh, so how how could you help them? You know. Uh, in this uh, you know area, do you get the question? Yes, uh, actually since uh, 2015 we start our open government project, and every year we teach our uh, um, government agency, the the employee of government agency, to know what is the open data and uh, what is uh, the data, what what kind of data should be opened and uh, what kind of technology or what kind of the standards they have to comprise that to open those data. So year by year, our government uh, employees or every government employee, now they know 
very better of, of the open data. So right now we don't we don't need to teach them how to open the data. We just want them to open more variable data. How, what is the variable data? This variable data data related to the data that people want to use it. So we want they to uh, become a higher level to thinking about what what kind of data the people will use uh, will want to use and uh, also we want we teach the the government employee how to make those data make use of those data by themselves because sometimes the agencies they they think they in in the past they think they only you open data but there are no benefit for themselves but we teach them how to use those who use the data of their own and uh, the other agency and to make their decision better, their policy better for, for their own goods. For example, the, the, the some, some uh, 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 local government, they use those data to um, improve their traffic and also to, to um, uh, attract the, the people to to their, their counties because they use the data to know what kind of the data uh, what to, to, to make a application for the for the other tourists uh, and uh, those tourists because before they come to those county they can get online and to make some make some uh, uh, to know some some something about the, this county let's let's uh, when those uh, uh, county uh, governments, they know better about how to use the data and they have benefit from using those data. They, they will have the passion to, to open more data and to reuse more data and to cooperate with some uh, data scientists to, to better uh, uh, um, get data or, or feedback to those data uh, provider to ask them to open more uh, qualified data or the useful data for that. So that's our mechanism to teach our, uh, not only government agencies, but government uh, employee, but also the local government uh, uh, headquarters to, to use those data and to have the sense what kind of data they can use and what kind of data they should open. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So we do help uh, those government officials, both at the local level and the central uh, level, to help them. You know, if they uh, need, you know, uh, more uh, skills or knowledge. Okay, there's another question. Um, it's to Davy. How do you keep citizens interested in using government open data? What initiatives do you provide? Do you get it, Davy? You can. Okay. Yeah. Uh... With, with the current progress of information technology, each app is also grossly, uh, grossly. Every government performance is related to its citizen and the variety of data has the value of to use. The government is not only providing data that people may be interested in, but also ponder which data can offer as much as possible. Uh, there's following are two situations where people will pay attention to government data. Uh, first, the data is which closely related to lives. For example, GIS data, weather prediction, trans tra uh, traffic, transportation, investment and money, money management that we mentioned before. Uh, lots of professional development can invent many various added applications through website or uh, add traffic to apps. And consumers can earn money by developing their creativity. Uh, okay, Debbie, that's your answer. Uh, there's, a, there's a second. Second is the data about budget that. Fin uh, final accounts, duty registered factors, and the significant meeting minutes. Such data is hard to make a profit, but as a 
democratic society. The data is often used by people to supervise the government and also correspond to transparency that the open government promotes. Besides uh, beside to satisfy people's right to know, we provide means for them to seek data from the government. Each com com competent authority will evaluate whether the data can be provided, helping people obtain when they, what they need as much as possible to promote the culture of government open data. Okay, thank you. That's all. Okay. Yeah, thank you, David. Ken, you want to uh, have more information? I I think uh, uh, just I as I mentioned before that people, um, if we want to uh, make some incentive for for the people, mostly people have the patience to use those data and make uh, application for uh, general public to use, and also some some people they want to use those data to get a uh, profit. So we, what what we should do is to make an environment for them to freely use those data, and also we to maintain the quality of those data and let them to uh, easier to use. So those those have patient people, they they can use those data very easily, and they can use the data free freely. Then that's uh, most uh, incentive for them to to use it. And also, I think uh, some people they they want to um, supervise the the government. So we also open some data that's uh, related to the government budget, the government programs, and so on. So those those kind of people they can use those data and to know that what government are doing right now and what the 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 budget spending, and then they can use those data and to make uh, some um, uh, training. Uh, train a uh, uh, chart to tracing that what government are doing and uh, is that is they uh, is government are doing well i think those are the the uh, incentive for uh, for the the people thank you thank you ken for sharing with us the additional information uh, there's another question uh, what are the safety and the security measures that these open data sites and the applications have to protect the personal information. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to clarify that if there's uh, open data, then there will not be any personal data in those uh, open data. So if there's a uh, open, if there's uh, uh, personal data, then those data could not be open freely. And if if government agencies want to open some data and those data are con are content with some personal data, then they have to use some technology to remove or to uh, re re revise those uh, personal data. Then the, only then they can open it to the general public. So there is no issue about uh, uh, personal data protections in open data area. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ken. There's another uh, question. Um, how do you support slash staff the teams that open or free up the data data sets so that they are clean and research friendly? I repeat the question. How do you support slash staff the teams that they okay uh, that open or free up the data sets so that they are clean and research friendly. You get it? Uh, kind of. Uh, I, I try to I try to explain, but if not a uh, uh, click to the point, then you can correct me. Uh, for those data, actually, we uh, we we mentioned that open data. We only have a few fields right now is open government data. So about the open government data, we only have to uh, teach or to help our government agency to open those data. And if they want to open, then we have a regulation and some guideline for them to make sure their, their data is uh, in some format, regular format, and uh, they have the correct metadata. So we have two mechanisms. First one is the automatic mechanism that 
we can automatically check if the metadata is correct and also to check the content content of the open data is is in the correct format and fits the metadata they 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 uh, uh, describe and uh, the other kind of uh, mechanism is um, we, we use a uh, personal uh, review because some data when they say the data change frequently or change maybe uh, five minutes or uh, one day, then we will use the people to check if the uh, change fre uh, frequent is uh, uh, really three minutes or one day. And to make sure those kind of, uh, um, if, if we can use the, 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 uh, the uh, automatic way to check, then we use the people to check and to make sure those uh, data, they really uh, have to have maintain their uh, frequency and maintain their quality. So I, I don't know if I answered the question. No problem, Ken. I know you tried your best. It seems this <laughs> uh, session will last only until 10 past 11. So I think we have time to allow maybe two more questions. There's uh, another question. What are the best practices of Taiwan in managing data slash storage of data that they can share with other countries, especially the Philippines. Do you get it? Uh, I'm sorry, could you? Okay, I, I repeated the question. Yeah. What are the best practices of Taiwan in managing data slash storage of data that they can share with other countries, especially the Philippines? So how you can share, you know, uh, the, the best practice in Taiwan in managing data and the data storage? Yeah. Uh, OK, uh, that's not easy to to respond. I, I, I think. Um, I think a mechanism is the, the very, um, very important uh, way I can share you one slice if 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 it's okay please let me share my slice could you see my slice right now uh, excuse me yes we can see go ahead Okay, uh, this is a mechanism. Uh, actually, in the David's slides, uh, he's talking about the mechanism to uh, improve the quality, improve the the uh, uh, environment for for the general public. But right now, I want to share the administration that we use to uh, to uh, maintain the or to ask our government to open the data or to make better use of their data. There is a two level of this uh, adversary, adversary committee. In the top, in top level, it's, it's led by a CIO and uh, it consists of some uh, ministries, the levels, uh, uh, high, high level uh, uh, ministers. And uh, the second level is conduct by every uh, ministries and these two kind of uh, adversary committee they in charge of something in the top level they uh, have some uh, regulation and uh, guideline for the national wide and for every ministry and for the ministry levels uh, adversary committee they in charge of how what kind of open data and what what kind or feedback from the people they should take care. So we think this committee, not, not, uh, no matter it's a top level or second level, in this committee, at least one third of the member have to come from the public, the public, the uh, scholar or the expert from the general public. Let's, let's make this decision, the open data decision, not biased to towards the uh, government. They will consider about the needs of the people. I think this mechanism is very important 
for our uh, government open data to share, really share the data the people want and uh, also to make the better decision about what kind of mechanism they should improve their data and uh, to promote the usage, reuse of the data. So I think this kind of the um, uh, uh, adversary committees is um, is what I want to share to the uh, to Philippines, and maybe you can uh, start from uh, form this kind of uh, adversary committees and uh, to make some uh, make some uh, uh, regulations or the the uh, guidelines for your for your uh, other uh, uh, ministries. And uh, I want to share that. Uh, can you see this this uh, portal? Yes. Yes. Okay. In this portal, this is our uh, government uh, open data portal. And in English version, about the about uh, 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 below the below about, you can see many regulations and the guidelines we are using right now. So maybe Philippine you can uh, check the, the guideline and the, the, the regulations to see if there are any you can adopt in your mechanisms. So that's what I want to share. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Uh, since now it's already uh, 11 past the 11. So now we are uh, moving uh, on to the next session, session four. Uh, I think originally we planned to have a short break. Uh, it's five minute break, but I think now uh, we'll uh, skip the break. We'll go directly to session four. And uh, so Lulu, are you there? Um, okay. Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, the session four uh, is the success of open government policy lies in the colla uh, collaboration between the public and the private sectors. So therefore, in this session, we will uh, learn, we will listen from the private sector's perspective. The first speaker is uh, Ms. Lulu Gen, Deputy Executive Chief Officer of the Open Culture Foundation. Lulu will introduce her foundation and talk about how civil society opens the government through the OGP, Open Government Policy Process. Lulu, now the floor is yours. Okay, um, first I may apology because my kid is doing a daily exercise on the roof just top of me, so you may hear some weird sound. It's like he's doing the activities. Sorry about that first. And then now I'm opening my uh, slide. Sorry. Okay, so can you hear? Uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, no problem. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um. So, um. Hi, everyone. I'm Lulu Ken, and it's my pleasure to be here and share my experience during the OGP process in Taiwan. So, uh, first, uh, what our foundation is doing. Actually, Open Culture Foundation is forming by open tech communities in Taiwan, and we have three core values, which is open source, open data, and open government. And based on these three core values, we also take a lot of the works about the issues of internet freedom, privacy, and security. And since 2016, Open Culture, open culture Foundation started to actively involve in this open government issue. During that, year, we, during that year, we take a whole year research and publish the Taiwan Open Government Report. And in the same year, we also attend the OGP Summit in Paris with our community partners. And then also in 2018 and 2019, we also attend the OGP Summit with community partners as a civil society delegation. So um, actually, in our past experience, we feel that um, Traditionally, interaction between civil society and the government actually is not that good. Uh, the graphic here is showing the common bad route that people feel something needs to be changed and they like, give requests and demand government to do it. And but the government, when government receives the pressure, they will back to their team and do the inner discussion and uh, generate a lot of plans. 
but those plans may not fit what people need, so people is not satisfied and get angry about government. But for government employee, they already work so hard to general plans, so they feel very frustrated about why they still be blamed. So what if there's another civil society and government interaction, such as when government saying, oh, I want to initiate or update a service, maybe they open a chance to people, a lot of people say, oh, this is what problem we face, or the, we need what kind of function. So before any actual plan is made, civil society and government maybe can come together, sit down and think the plan together. So uh, in my point of view, I think before address any plan is the key. I will use the tech system upgrade as a case to demonstrate what I mean. So in this slide, you can see there's a guy called Zhuo Zhiyuan. And the Zhuo has is a user experience expert, and he proposed the tax system upgrade idea on the joint platform, which everybody mentioned. And his proposal gets so many supports because honestly, the old tax system and website in Taiwan is really terrible. <laughs> it's nearly not good to use. So his purpose is passed. And surprisingly, Minister of Finance in Taiwan think if the job got so many great ideas, maybe we can ask him how to upgrade our tax system. So Minister of Finance directly invite Joe and under Audrey's office help, both of them together hold a four month co-creation meeting and a free workshop. All those processes, including all kinds of multi stakeholders, including, including government employee who take care of the tech system, and the general public, general user as citizen, and also the expert, like user experience and user interface designer, all together come to, to discuss what is really need. So I think they really done some three things very good. That first, they direct as user. Second, they identify what is really problem. And the third, the general solution by all multi stakeholders from both government side and the civil society side. So in the end, they'll be able to hand out a good prototype, which is fully reviewed and discussed by everyone. So by this prototype, engineer be able to finally develop an upgrade tech system website. And I have to say that uh, system now is really good. So basically, everybody's very happy. Um, however, in the traditional way I just mentioned, a typical idea may be go this kind of route, such as just proposal or idea may directly go into the government and only discuss within certain department or group. So we will hand the plan to the engineer, and the engineer will build a tech system without as any user. So some probably will not that good as what I just mentioned if they go through all the multi-stakeholder discussion process. So when we talk about Taiwan Open Government National Action Plan that I uh, involved as a member of the multi-stakeholder forum, which is also the, we call that text force, that um, during this process, my experience is the process actually is more similar as the text system case in Taiwan, which is a good thing. So the whole process is that exactly Yen collect idea from departments and the public uh, on joint platform, and the uh, exactly Yen give a national action plan draft to the NSF. But now we face a problem. When NSF first get this draft, our question is, where is the civil society voice? Can they have make more comment about the draft? Can they discuss more about this uh, action plan draft, but the government adjust their strategy very quickly because uh, except the Yen start to organize many meetings and a discussion. So allow the member of NSF and uh, the civil society expert and the government representative be able to discuss with the department, those department and administrate who contact, uh, who take care of the commitments. So in the end, the all 19 commitments have gone through this process, and some of the commitments even be able to co edited by both civil society and government. So in the end, 
the as as an NS member, I'm very happy receive a much better uh, national action plan and it got passed. And uh, since this is our first time to doing this process, I think it's a really good start that we have experienced this and uh, try to adjust it during the, what's going to happen. So back to what I mentioned, if we go back to the traditional way, the route will likely read error. It let government give the draft, as I've read it and passed. So there's no other uh, discussion, and I think that those action plan will less fit what people's need. So um, in last one year, I finally have a lot of chance to work with the government employees and have a conversation with them. I, I totally can start to get at what they feel, such as when we announce that, oh, we are going to do the ultimate plan, their first inf that reaction will be, what? Is that one more thing to do? And what is OGP? That, uh, how can I do it? And But the most uh, serious problem is a lot of government employees doesn't believe civil society can be their partner because in their past experience, civil society always in opposite side, yelled on land as a tiger, or keep blaming on land, and don't willing to cooperate. So in the beginning, when we talk about how to do the co-creation, I think the government employees actually don't believe it's work. Um, but fortunately, after a year, I think they can, they can see there is will be potential to doing that. So during the process, we can see that our government employee that we talk with and we work with start to think, oh, civil society can really help us even write the plan together. And uh, also we keep telling the government employees say KPI is not necessary. The most important thing is identify what is really problem. Even your commitment just have one line, that one solution. It's still better than you write down 10, 20 things, but not really fit what really need. So you just spend so many time and feel frustrated. Um, so from civil society perspective, I think OGP is a door to create an environment to allow the civil society and the government to co-work. And also OGP is process is able to make changes systematically across the department within government. Because before when Taiwan talking about open government, open data, it's only always conduct in this department do their own thing that department do their own thing, but under this OGP process, finally, those departments can see each, what each other is doing and uh, try to learn from each other. And the third thing is, since OGP is a global methodology, that we are be able to exchange experience with our international partner by using the same language. And the last thing, I think the most important thing is, uh, OGP, the purpose of OGP for me is not achieve the commitment perfectly. O the purpose of OGP is use this process to start to change the culture and dynamic between civil society and government so we can have a better route to form what is service fit to government and uh, the general pu public. And I really hope this cultural change can be long term when we conduct this OGP in the next three years. Um, so this is kind of my conclusion about the major point I found during this OGP process. And beside the government part I already mentioned, that um, last two point actually is about my observation from a civil society side. Actually, in the beginning, Civil society in Taiwan is not willing to involve in OGP that much as what we hope. There's many reasons. Why reason is no, not too few people and too few organizations know what is OGP, so they don't know why they have to join. And the second, that a lot of NGO in Taiwan is very small. They don't have enough resource or enough staff to join the OGP process or follow the OGP process. And the third one I think is also a very important one is that most of civil society organizations have to deal with too many urgent frontline issues. So
when, when I talk of them, they say just OJP seems too idealistic. It's just too slow to make change. So um, they're not sure if they have to involve it. Um, but I would not say OJP or open government is only answer to move, make the society uh, move forward. But I really hope during this process, we can uh, let government understand you don't need eager to generate plans. Maybe we can talk first. So when we have a plan, that will be a good plan. So you don't need the government don't need to keep 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 doing thing, but people still not satisfied. So uh, in my opinion, I will think the government can sometimes stop and ask what is really need. And for civil society side, I will also hope they will think another way to work with the government instead of just demand what they should do. So. We also work for a lot of civil society group here. They're willing to be the partner of the government to work together. So I think this whole OGP process is a good learning process for both government and civil society. So um, this is my brief sharing, and I look forward like everybody's feedback later. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu. Thank you very much for your uh, very lively and informative presentation. Uh, please stay with us uh, because later we are going to have the QA, so don't leave. And uh, I can assure you that as a government employee, I'm very willing to work together with Open Culture Foundation. And uh, now uh, let me uh, invite the second speaker. The second uh, presentation is Taiwan's Digital Transformation Development and the Use Cases. The speaker is Mr. Chris Hong. Deputy Director General and Industry Consultant of the Institute for Information Industry, um, or Triple I. Triple I is the leading organization in Taiwan to promote information communication technology innovation and applications in Taiwan, and to assist in the development of the digital economy. Now let's welcome Chris. Uh, Chris, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Xu, and uh, hello, uh, Under Secretary of Long, and all the ladies and gentlemen there. Um, I try to share my slides. Okay, can you see the slides now? Yes, no problem. Go ahead. Okay, uh, my name is Chris Hong. I'm the Deputy Director General of MIC, which is the Department of uh, Institute for Information Industry. MIC plays the role as a think tank to our government and the consultant to the industry as well. We do market and the industry research in Taiwan, especially on the ICT industry. And it's really my pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you our observations on the development of Taiwan's digital transformation and uh, some use cases. And this is uh, the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk about the development of digital transformation first. And then there are some use cases in um, IT industry and some cases in manufacturing and the healthcare industry. And we found that digital transformation is a hot topic in the past few years. Not only the government, but also the industries in Taiwan have tried to develop their digital transformation programs to enhance their competitiveness through the applications of digital technologies. We define the digital transformation as the process of using digital technologies to, challenge, to change the creation and the delivery of value. There are three stages for digital transformation in our definition. The first stage is digitalization. It is to apply the ICT technologies on the operation of business. And the second stage, Digital optimization is to use the technologies better to enhance the customer's experience or satisfaction. Satisfaction. 
The last stage is digital transformation. It's to create new products, services, and the business models with those uh, digital technologies. And there are many momentums driving our industries to invest on digital transformation. In the past two years, we found that the digital transformation has been accelerated under the impact of COVID-19 and the trade conflict between United States and uh, mainland China. As we all know, COVID-19 has changed the world. Due to the lockdown of many countries, we have to apply many IT technologies on business, on education, manufacturing, and healthcare, etc. The industry have to use more ICT technologies to maintain their business operation or to enhance their efficiency. Even more, some of them use the ICT technologies to develop new business models, trying to um, get a better development on the, under the, in, the impact of COVID-19. Other than the COVID-19 pandemic, the US-China trade conflict also stimulated the application of ICT technologies by the Taiwanese companies as well. That's because our companies are forced to move or to extend their manufacturing capacities from China to Taiwan or some other countries in Southeast Asia, such as Philippines. To enhance their efficiency, the smart manufacturing technologies have been applied um, in various uh, industries. And in this section, I'm going to share with you some of the use cases of um, Taiwan's industries. The first one is what I just mentioned, the ICT industry. Some Taiwanese companies, ICT companies, try to use big data and AI to do the market forecast and the supply chain management in the past few years. Especially, it's a big challenge for our companies to predict the market demand and to ensure the key component supply chain recently. The change is so huge. And that's because of the turbulence caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the US-China trade conflict. Taiwan's companies try to develop their focus model with AI and the big data. I think those models are still under construction right now. But to deal with the dynamic of the market, Taiwanese ICT companies will keep developing those models in the future. And the second one uh, is the, another uh, application of ICT technologies uh, by I, Taiwan's um, companies. Not only the uh, technologies applied on business operation, the industry also applied various technology on their manufacturing and the logistics to enhance their production efficiency. For example, they use automated optical inspection, we call AOI technology, on the PCBA inspections. They increase the accuracy of inspection and the efficiency as well. The details of how they apply the AOI on their production in this page, uh, I think it's for your, uh, can for your uh, reference. In some other manufacturing industries, they also apply various digital technologies to transform their business. For example, there is a company named Teco, the same name as our uh, uh, Taipei uh, Economic Cultural Office, uh, but that's Teco is Dongyuan. Uh, Teco used a uh, three-dimension vision robots and uh, AGVs to build an automated motor uh, production lines. Other than that, Teco also established an intelligent and flexible production line. They connect and integrate the information from ERP, MES, and various manufacturing, manufacturing equipments. The efficiency has been increased significantly, as you can see in the right side of this slide. And healthcare industry also adopt ICT technologies aggressively in the past few years. The hospitals use the digital technologies to assist the medical treatment and to improve their efficiency. For example, in the right-hand side, you can see that the Taipei Medical University Hospital use medical imaging technology to develop surgical recording equipment to record the entire operation process. 
They also introduce AI to assist on marking organs during the operation. And the surgical image education platform is applied to conduct surgical simulation training as well. And not only the cases we just mentioned on ICT manufacturing and the healthcare industry, almost all industries in Taiwan pay a lot of attention on digital transformation from B2C to B2B or even B2G businesses. We see many industries get involved in digital transformation. It's not only because of the impact of COVID-19 and the US-China trade conflict. It's because of the benefit that digital transformation can create. We believe it's a long-term trend. The ICT technology has been gradually penetrated um, into people's life. Once people experience the benefit of digital technologies, they will continue to use them. It's not only a support a supply push issue, but also it's a demand pool for digital transformation in Taiwan. So, of course, um, we believe it's not easy to promote and to implement the digital transformation. There still are some obstacles. One is the cross-domain cooperation between different industries. Another one is the cultural shocks caused by the changes from introducing digital technologies to the companies or even the societies. And we found most of the obstacles come from people's mindset. Therefore, we believe change of mindset will be the first step of digital transformation. In the past few years, we spend much of the time on communicating with different parties in the companies and the societies. Once they have the same goal, we have the same goal, share the same vision, I think things can be much more easier. So in my conclusion, we think it's a good time for us to go for digital transformation, not only in Taiwan, but also in many other countries in the world, including Philippines, our friends there. And to make digital transformation successful, we need to cooperate with so many partners no matter from domestic or global uh, industries. I believe we can find a lot of opportunities to co-work with our friends in Philippines. And I look forward to have further discussion with you in the future. And this is my presentation. Thanks for your listening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. It's a very wonderful and a very uh, you know, informative and a very good presentation. You are a very articulate speaker. So they, uh, Chris, you have to stay with us and uh, for the QA. And uh, so, now, yeah, I would like to uh, uh, invite the uh, next speaker. Uh, last but not least, we would like to invite uh, Ms. Isabel Ho, co-founder of uh, GovZero. International Task Force to present a very timely topic, data, crowdsourcing, and uh, GovX, GovZero, how a civic tech community collaborates with the government to help combat COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, let's welcome Isabel. Isabel, please go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yes. Thank you, Investor Xu. I applied, uh, apologize for the title is so long. Uh, can you see my uh, slides? Yes. Yes, no, okay, no, yes. that's great. Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm Isabel from GovZero community. Uh, thanks for being here. I think maybe it's time for you to stand up and get some stretches. Uh, I'm very grateful to have this chance to share my experiences as an organizer in GovZero community with friends in uh, from Philippines. First is because we uh, we always want to reach out to communities in um, in Southeast Asia, uh, Asia region, and uh, also it's because I have always have special feelings for Philippines because my uh, father. Ha, has uh, got his um, master's degree in University of Philippines 30 years ago. And uh, I will use three keywords to introduce myself. First, I'm a co-founder of GovZero International Task Force, and I'm a lawyer focusing in innovation law, and I'm committee members uh, of Open Parliament uh, Multi-Stakeholder uh, Forum in Taiwan. And uh, I will start my uh, my uh, 
I will start with um, the three pillars in the society. Um, it is said we need three pillars in the society to uh, to make the society sustainable. First is government, the second is market, and the third one is community. However, the third one, the community has been always left behind. So in 2012, um, GovZero, a group of uh, contributors contributors from uh, open source uh, community here has this motto, ask nobody is doing this. You are the nobody. So since the, there is nobody seems in the community as the third pillar in the society, then we started to, uh, Gov Zero as the third uh, pillar in the society. The Gov Zero community, um, aims to use technology in interest of the public good, allowing citizen easy access to vital information, information and the power to shape the civil society. We replace uh, uh, O in Gov with zero. So it uh, has this in, use internet and the digital thinking to change uh, the society and the, maybe the government. In a recent survey uh, we do we did from our contributors, the keywords of a God Zero community is collaboration, open source, cross domain, and hands-on. So the formula in God Zero society is uh, in community is open source plus cross domain plus hands-on or uh, activism equal God Zero collaborations. So how do we do this? It started in 2012 uh, with the first Gov Zero hack zones. It, um, there are almost uh, 100 persons there. And the first project is about uh, government budget visualization. Uh, you can see there is a small and a big uh, bubble or circles in, um, on the pages. The smaller one means the smallest amount of government uh, budget, and the bigger one are bigger amount of government uh, budgets. So people can uh, understand and uh, realize uh, how much is spent and the, the rations of the uh, government page, uh, budget is spent. And um, after nine years, we have um, um, we have already held uh, 44. Um, hack zones, and uh, we have uh, over 10,000 um, participants in Slack channel, and uh, we have um, more than 700 proposals. And uh, here is the uh, here is the project um, by owned by Audrey Tang, who is uh, um, the uh, contributors in the government too. Uh, in the uh, community, God Zero community too. And uh, the keywords of um, the God uh, Zero community includes open source, hands-on, and the public spirits. So this is a manifesto we, we write down and uh, um, in God Zero community. Um, it means we come from everywhere so everybody can join and we are citizens collaborating to bring about change. We are a polycentric community of self-organized contributors. We live open source, we have fun and want to change the status quo. And we are you. So ask not, uh, don't ask who is uh, nobody doing this. You are the nobody. So you can just join uh, the community to do something. So we are a polycentric community of so self-organized uh, contributors. You can see there are many symbols or marks in the uh, in this big circle. So it means uh, different projects in the community, and uh, each project has their own owners, and um, um, is not controlled by other um, participants. Everyone in the community can propose their ideas and they start their own projects and they invite people to join uh, their projects. And the participants in the projects can decide their own, um, their own governance. 
But um, even we don't control each other, uh, there is no hierarchy. Gap zero contributors share uh, the same value and have, sen have the same norm and uh, also uh, use uh, the same tools to communicate together. You can see the value we share includes open source, active then on uh, uh, transparency, equal, liberal, self-organized, polycentric, and also fun. Um, you can see some of these um, values are brought into the government by OG um, when he became the digital minister. And um, so there are more than 10,000 Slack users or participants in Gov Zero. Um, um, in the COVID-19, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, this May, we have 700 new participants, over 900 colla uh, collaborators or contributors, and we started 15 uh, new projects in one month. Uh, so you can see the polycentric, the power of polycentric or self-organized uh, community is very powerful and overwhelming. So next, I'm going to share three uh, cases, uh, three projects to show how we collaborate together. And the first one is a, a mask map. You have seen this um, um, just mentioned by OG. And um, um, the communication are all uh, happened in the Gov0 uh, Slack. So there is an engineer start his own um, product, um, map. And um, someone in the Slack said, yes, I am do something alike, uh, similar. But the, um, the engineer find out he got a bill of 20 thousand uh, US dollars um, from the Google because, because he used uh, Google map services and then oh, he's quite surprised because uh, he thinks the, the amount well, is, um, of um, bill is in um, new Taiwan dollars. However, it's not in, in US dollars. And then uh, Audrey come to act as the coordinator to open up necessary data from the Gov Zero uh, community, uh, from the government to Gov Zero community. So um, the people in the community started to work to work on the um, their projects and waiting for the data to come in. So they work around the clock for two days and uh, many different uh, and all these communications have happened and collaboration happened in Gov Zero Slack. So after the data was open, many contributors developed the different forms of websites, application, and visualization. And uh, after um, it's uh, over 100 in total. And this is what happened last year. So you can see open data with open data from the government and the, the, the government zero contributor analyze, visualize and uh, doing service design with the uh, open data. It becomes apps and websites for the public. And the next one is um, um, 1922 uh, contact, er, er, contact tracing system. Uh, designed this year, in, uh, deployed this year. Um, it's an uh, implication of God Zero um, contact uh, tracing app by the government and, or, and uh, private companies. So it's an um, idea proposed and it is discussed and, um, in the God Zero community uh, with uh, Audrey and the Audrey bring back the architecture and the ideas uh, back to the government and uh, find someone to do deploy the apps uh, to integrate all the um, resources needed to to realize the the idea, and it becomes the one nine two two contact tracing system, which is very uh, helpful in combating um, uh, COVID nineteen. And uh, the next one is the uh, integration. Um, 
uh, platform. Because transparency and uh, accurate information will help each individual make the right decision to protect himself during pandemic. And uh, so uh, information is uh, very important. So the um, Gov Zero, many, many uh, contributors in the Gov Zero uh, uh, community started to aggregate information. They, and uh, we aggregated these information uh, into one um, website or one HackMD. Um, it includes uh, vaccine information and in, it includes relief fund information and uh, in, in, uh, it includes labor uh, guidelines from the uh, government and uh, we translate it into different languages. And also we have these debunking rumors sections uh, have blind vote to, you can ask uh, and back check the information you got uh, in the line. And also there are some uh, good life under uh, COVID-19 um, uh, sections, which includes online mental health services platform. It provides information. Uh, for people to find uh, to find the mental health services, and also we have this Gov Zero vegetable boxes information. Uh, you can just uh, order the uh, foods or the vegetables or or uh, you need online. And also, this is um, um, a vaccine information. You can find the COVID nineteen vaccine you need with the map. And uh, however, this one is uh, replaced by a new one uh, developed by uh, Audrey with the government uh, engineers. So in this case, you can see the information from government and the market um, will be uh, aggregated or sorted, visualized and uh, designed by the contributors in Gov Zero. Then uh, it will provide it uh, provided to the public. And uh, this is um, um, the um, what I'm going I'm going to share uh, when, uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from your introduction and from your uh, you know uh, presentation. It's very uh, you know uh, informative. It's wonderful, and uh, you have to stay with us. Now we move on to the QA period of this session. Uh, since we already use uh, more time uh, than uh, originally planned, so uh, I would like to make an announcement that uh, you know uh, this session uh, will come to an end until 12:20 uh, because I already uh, saw uh, several questions on Slido, and uh, so uh, without further ado, I will. Uh, Ask the first question. Okay, the first question is for uh, for Lulu. Lulu, are you there? Lulu. Hi. Hi. Okay, um, you are there. Okay, this this question is for you. Uh, how can the government sector first remodel its approach to achieve a more modernized and engaging consultative process with the CSOs? I I, I guess it's a civil society organizations. So Lulu, do you get it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, actually this remodel is not only can be done by government only. I think it's civil society and government have to learn each other. And I saw another question is about like also how to uh, empower government, how to empower, empower civil society. And I think it is also similar that these two sides should be uh, come together, talk, and I think it's the most important is how to open a door. That the, the first step is most important. And many things we don't know how to do because we never have a chance to talk with the government employee. That we may able to propose the idea on joint platform, but we may not be able to directly talk with the government employee because after I talk to them, I will think, oh, my idea is just too idealistic because within the government system there is a many limited. I never know. So what I propose may not fit government can do, but what government propose may not fit what user need. 
So I think uh, how to remodel or how to empower both sides is to find the door which can open for both sides to talk. Um, but I would, but it's not that easy that like if the people, the civil society call me and if you just put the government people and the civil society people sit together, sometimes make disaster and nothing will accomplish. So the door will be, should be open first, but the second is how to make conversation that need to be designed and uh, that's why Audrey's of the office, the project, the PDS is very important because PDS it is very good to decide how to make conversation interact well. That like how to make sure government say something and civil society understand, and the civil society say something and the government understand. Because during the process, I heard a lot of uh, government employees say they try to do this kind of conversation. They call the people calm have a meeting, but those people doesn't want to talk. They want to just yell on each other and blame on the government employees. They, they just don't believe that works. So I just introduce them and say, hey, you can go ask PDs to help you to decide what is good conversation meeting. So I would say first open the door, but second, you need to have a methodology to uh, make both side conversation can go in well. And I think this is also a uh, a very uh, professional field led to dealing with this multi-stakeholder opinions. Okay, thank you, Lulu. I think uh, both the government employee and also the civil society uh, group, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, they have to do their homework first, then uh, they can be on the same page, then they can have a very good dialogue and uh, work, working together. And uh, to be fair to Lulu, Chris, and uh, Isabel, and uh, Chris, are you there? Now I have a question for you. Yes, please. Okay, Chris, how does the manufacturing industry adopt with the manpower and the cost in, in, increases as a result of the changes in customer orders from volume production to small volume, large variety production? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this is a um, very practical questions because we see a lot of uh, companies are dealing with these kind of uh, issues. And as you can see that um, the, the type of the production move from the mass production to the uh, small volume, large, large variety uh, uh, type. So I think small manufacturing is one of the answers. And when the production move from the <clears throat> mass production to so-called small volume, large variety, and I think the e efficiency and the flexibility of production uh, line, the production line are more important than before. Not only uh, to make the machines to be automatic, but also we have to make the machines more smart and to, to be smart. And uh, we can apply the artificial intelligence technologies and uh, the Internet of Things and data technologies uh, on the small manufacturing um, uh, field. And as you can see in the case of uh, Dongyuan Teco, and it's a great example, and uh, they use those kind of um, technologies to uh, change their uh, type of production. And there is another typical uh, uh, example in Taiwan that we all know that uh, the major foundry uh, company TSMC, they use a lot of the kind of technologies to deal with um, the new type of production. So uh, I hope uh, the answer can uh, uh, fit in your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Now we have a question uh, for Isabel. Okay, can a 1922 contact tracing system be replicated in the Philippines? How? Uh, I use <laughs> this system every time uh -huh. I enter in any shops or offices. It's only five. Uh, okay. The, the other say, I, I, can, I, can, I don't understand what's the five uh, sec whole five, safe. Uh, five seconds? Big no, yeah. Something yeah, like so that. You, yeah. Yes, so, yeah it's, it, because it takes uh, five seconds to scan the QR code. 
uh, QR code and uh, got the link and sent out the message. Uh, I'm not sure it can be deployed by in Philippines because it needs uh, co cooperations uh, from the uh, telecom companies. Um, and uh, but the architectures are yeah. I think you you can try it, but it's not uh, open sourced. Uh, because it's deployed uh, in the government by the government, um, uh, by the government. So, um, but um, uh, at the beginning, the engineers uh, in Gov Zero community they want to deploy the uh, the idea or the uh, the idea or architecture um, by themselves. So, yeah, I think it could be uh, deployed. Yeah. By someone, if you there are someone in Philippines wants to to do that, we I think the community uh, um, in Taiwan and also Audrey will be very glad to help. Yeah, to find out if we can do anything to to help. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Thank Lulu. you. Next question is for Lulu. Do CSOs? Civil society organizations co-implement and monitor the implementation of OGP NAPs in Taiwan. If yes, how do CSOs monitor government with regard to NAP commitments? You got it, Lu? Yes, yes, I got it. But this is a really good question because we, for now, we just accomplish the first step of OGP process that we have a national action plan which is discussed by civil society representative and government but the monitoring indeed is next very like uh, task is a very difficult task because everyone's asking that a civil society member of NSF keep always asking about okay now the action plan is published government start to conduct it. So how do we monitor it? Um, this is indeed a good question. Um, so all of during the discussion, but I will say that OGP have their own functions, such as they have a independent review mechanism. Although uh, Taiwan is not a member of OGP yet, so we are not be able to directly apply that. But the idea is that government and the civil society may have to pay to support uh, to give out the half of a budget to form a special grant. The special grant should hire a third party uh, uh, researcher to do the assessment about how this commitment doing. So uh, the monitoring which is very powerful is conducting the similar process of what OJP required that each country have to conduct independent review uh, mechanism. So that's the next step what monitoring can do. But we don't want to see result after assessment. We wanted to do able to have also suggestion during the process. So when we see the problem, if we can uh, quickly feedback to the government, they can fix the problem quicker rather than in the end they get better better score. <laughs> I don't think that everyone wanted to see that. But how to make that uh, uh, suggestion quickly enough in time that um, I would say it's still under the discussion and we were also willing to hear experience from the Philippines partner because I think you already conduct the OGP process um, more than one times. Yes, so um, maybe you also can provide us a tip. Well, how can we do the monitoring during the process? During the process, not wait until the um, review done. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu. Uh, Chris, next question is for you. What yes. advice would you give to a country that wants to push for digital transformation but has a low rate of technological adoption? OK, uh, I saw that question. Uh, thank you. And this is a very good question. And uh, I think the uh, key is on the user experience. And when people uh, uh, get get the benefit from those technologies, they will be excited to use them uh, as long as they can. So I think uh, the the major point is not a supply push only, and not a government's promotion only. 
I think for the government, government should do what should what government should do is to build up a good infrastructure uh, for those technologies to be applied. And for the business sector, for the companies, for, from, uh, frankly speaking, they just want to uh, they want to get a profit. They want to get a business running. So they just try to get a good business model from those uh, from the application of those technologies. For consumers, what they want is to enjoy those technologies, to enjoy those use experiences. So uh, I think um, now we try to think of think that kind of question is not only from the push or promotion from the industry side or just the, the government side, but uh, it's uh, very uh, important for the consumer to build up good user experience in the kind of applications. So this is my, uh, my answer, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Isabel, next question is for you. Who approves or validates? Okay, okay. who approves mm -hmm. or validates the mm -hmm. data sets slash information that get uploaded in the uh, Gov Zero Gov Zero, Zero platform? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is a really good question. Um, as I just mentioned in my sharing, that um, there are many different platforms in GovDevil community, uh, which includes Slack, uh, HackMD, it's a um, collaboration nodes um, uh, tools, and they, it includes uh, Facebook fan pages and the Twitters, and uh, also includes a website under the uh, GovDevil.tw domain. Um, so there are different uh, governance of each of these platforms because we want to be as open as possible. So in the Slack, everyone can just um, share what he wants and he can share the link of his work and uh, everyone can uh, collaborate on HackMD. So as you just, uh, the inter integration uh, platform, uh, for uh, COVID-19 uh, information, uh, everyone can just uh, put up his um, uh, his uh, website link in the uh, in the web pages. Um, so um, this is uh, the the as open as possible. But um, there are some which needs uh, approval of um, the uh, the team the management team, just like. Uh, um, um, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook fan, uh, fan pages, and uh, also just like the tweeters, and uh, the if you want to uh, put your uh, projects um, under the domain of gazero.dw, or uh, there will be you need to go through some processes, and these processes are uh, de determined by the uh, small a uh, small group of people who are in charge in uh, these different uh, platforms and the, the member of each uh, government uh, uh, um, uh, management uh, team in platform in each uh, platform are different. So we want to be as uh, polycentric as possible. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, uh, uh, Isabel. And OK, uh, last question. Uh, anyone can answer this question. I mean, uh, either one of you, you know, Lulu, Chris, and uh, Isabel. Do you incentivize people who can provide uh, solutions to a societal provided or who have contributed positively to the government? Do you get the question? I I'll repeat it. Do you incentivize people who can provide uh, solutions to a societal provided or who have contributed positively to the government? Who would be the volunteer to answer this question? Yeah, maybe I can share the, um, the, my experiences in Gov Zero community. Um, I'm not sure I just, uh, did I mention there are 99.9 percent of um, of God zero contributors are volunteers actually we have only four time uh, two full time uh, staff in the whole community um but um uh, so we do not provide mo um, monetary incentive to 
the contributors. However, we provide uh, spaces for them to um, to collaborate with uh, other contributors, and uh, we we provide um, we organize the events like uh, hackathons as uh, easy to uh, participant and uh, as much fun as possible. And uh, we want, want to make sure, uh, we try our best to make our contributors to feel meaningful uh, when they um, contribute. So I think these are uh, incentives uh, for the contributors to uh, stay in the com community. Uh, it's not a uh, monetary rewards, but uh, it's uh, you can have fun and you can uh, have you can feel meaningful, and uh, so you can find someone to uh, collaborate together. And actually, among our um, um, survey surveys, many of the contributors um, in the community says they said they find their partners for lifetime. In the community, because they just think it's great to have uh, partners to change the society together. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Isabel. I don't know uh, whether uh, Lulu or Chris uh, would like to make uh, additional comments. It's up to you, Lulu. Yeah, because I'm KVC incentive because. Um, I think the people in civil society generally have their, their basic, the basic incentive is that we want the society better and uh, we have, want a better life. Um, but the OCF as a foundation acting as a little bit different as uh, other organization is that uh, our main job actually supported community such as GovZero. So for us, like, we will see if anyone want to contribute to the world to the society, to any stakeholder. If their idea is open and like open source or they're willing to open data, like OCF, it, our job is just supporting them to do their job good. So for in my perspective, like as a foundation, I not be able to solve all the problems. But if anyone on the society, even from the government side, even from the private uh, company side, they want to solve the problem, we are the one that are willing to support them like fully hard led by discuss with them what can do best and such as uh, some tech force in Gov Zero or project Gov Zero, we provide administration support because they may not have enough people to doing that. So I think that each group, each person have different role. They may not direct contribute to the issue, but everyone can do what they can do, such as maybe we will not solve the issue directly, but we can support them. So I think in the end, everyone just want to have a better life. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is my like what I can eat. Okay, uh, Chris, any more comments or no, no? No, I don't have any further comment for this question. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we adjourn this uh, online uh, conference, uh, I know uh, Under Secretary Ablan, you are still there. Are you there, Chris? Okay, maybe uh, Under Secretary Ablan already left, but anyway. Yes, I'm here, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, okay, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, would you like to say something before we adjourn this uh, online conference, please? Oh, uh, I am inter internally grateful to uh, Teco and to you, uh, Ambassador Xu, for uh, uh, helping us organize this. I learned a lot uh, since nine o'clock from uh, my discussion with uh, Minister Tang, all the way up to the discussions of our CSO friends there in uh, Taiwan. Uh, Lulu, thank you. Isabel, thank you. Mr. Chen, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, your learnings. I'm pretty sure my colleagues from OGP here also uh, learned uh, because of the questions. There are just so many questions. Thank you for answering them. Thank you very much, Under Secretary Ablang. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Minister uh, Audrey Tang and uh, also uh, Under Secretary Aplan and also uh, all the speakers, including uh, the speakers from our National Development Council and also Lulu, Chris, and Isabel. I think today's uh, meeting is only, uh, you know, like a matchmaker. You know, uh, I hope that uh, you know through this online meeting, 
uh, if in the future our Filipino friends, you know, would like to uh, you know work together with the uh, civil society organization in Taiwan, and uh, I think you can go through uh, you know uh, secretary uh, Aplan's office and also uh, my office. Uh, we would uh, be happy to uh, match make you know um, uh, the civil societies organization uh, both in Taiwan and in the Philippines since we are very close neighbor. And uh, I do uh, hope that, you know, uh, this is just a beginning. I think uh, open society government is very important. Uh, you know, I believe open society has no enemy. So, uh, but uh, this culture, you know, takes time uh, to uh, cultivate. So even I'm a layman of uh, open government, but I know uh, it's very important. So, uh, uh, thank. Uh, I would like to say again. You know, I'm very grateful to all the participants, to all the speakers, and uh, to the minister, to the under secretary. And I hope to see you in the future again, uh, either online or you know physically. Uh, thank you very much. Now I announce the adjournment of today's online conference. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank Have you. a good one. Oh, one second, one second. A group photo. One second. Don't don't go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a photo, a photo. Okay. 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 Thank you again. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much. Your English is very good. Chinese culture is great. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.